So if we could start with your full name, please. Full name, George W. Hughes, Jr. What's the W stand for? What? What does the W stand for? Nothing. It's just a letter. They just gave you a letter? It's just a letter. No period. All right. Seriously, I didn't even know that. I met a guy yesterday whose first name no. was J. Oh, you, you want my... J. Okay. You, do you want my Navy record? Yeah. So I'm going to ask you, uh, what's your birthday? <clears throat> what's your June, date of birth? June 22nd, 1918, in Loyalton, California. All right. And you, you mentioned you were in the Navy during World War II. Yes. So tell me about your, uh, your service history with the Navy. Service history in the Navy. I was at working for Consolidated Aircraft on the B-24, and then I uh, was, I was at Willow Run, and Truman came in and changed the powers of be a Willow Run. So I I was we were all of us that were de developed Willow Run bomber plant were fired. So I came back to Consolidated. They put me on the, the, the power plants of, of the B-46, the same spec as the B-47. And I had that job I hired R.D. McCart. When they closed down Brewster, R.D. McCart was the chief engineer of Brewster. And the Navy brought R.D. McCart out there. And R.D. McCart went through the personnel at Consolidated decided he wanted me for his assistant. It turned out to be a stool pigeon job. I worked for him for 10 days. I told him, no, I want to go back on the power plant to B-46. The B-46 was the same specs of B-47. Only it was looked like a two-engine airplane. It had two engines, two jet engines, and the landing gear retracted between the two, so it only had two nacelles. Two big nacelles, so it was a beautiful airplane, all right? So I, I go back there, and R.D. McCart uh, set up experimental design, design so that he, I was having trouble doing anything. I, I turned down a job with him, and, I, and you don't do that. And, if I'm working for a company, you're working for a company. When you turn down a job, why, it's a, it's a bad deal. And I've told all my kids that. So uh, they told me that uh, I, they couldn't. I couldn't quit. They, they, we had a big meeting really with uh, Secretary of Labor, Ma Perkins. She came out and she, she had a big meeting. There were. Five of us, all design engineers, all quitting at the same time due to R.D. McCart and his organization. So they told, told all of us that we couldn't quit. So all of us volunteered for the service right then. Mm -hmm. I volunteered for the Navy. And I was supposed to go to Patuxent River, Maryland, under Commander Conley. What year did you join the Navy? Yeah. Well, what? What year did you join the Navy? It was 1943. So I go through training at Tucson, Arizona, a 90-day training period. And when it ended up, my orders came in, Fort Pierce, Florida. So I call Commander Connolly, and he says, George, I'm going to Bupers tomorrow. I'll call you tomorrow night. And so he, he goes to Bupers, and he calls me back at night. He said, George, do you play water polo for Cal? I said, yes. He said, your swimming's worth more than your engineering. <laughs> so I was at Fort Pierce, Florida, which is the amphibious training base, the major amphibious training base. Okay. I'm going to stop you there, and I want to rewind a little bit. What? I want to rewind a little bit. I want to talk about your childhood before we get too deep into your, your service history. Uh, Where in California did you say you grew up? 
I grew up in Oakland, California. Okay, and uh, tell me about your parents. What were their names and what did they do? My dad was George W. Hughes, and my mom was Bertha Libby. Okay. Her maiden, name was, her maiden name was Libby, and uh, her mother was Matilda McDougall. And she was, the McDougall family was the wealthy family of Scotland for years and, until they got overthrown by the family that's there now. Yeah. So the, a lot of my, my life history has to do with Scotland and the McDougall family, too. Right. What did your father do for work? My father was a school teacher and my mother was a school teacher. But my father was a major farmer in his heart. So he, he, we always had farms, it didn't matter what. Did you have any siblings growing up? What? Did you have brothers and sisters? I have one sister, Dorothy. Is she older or younger? She would, she was younger, two years younger than I am. And she, let's see. I don't know the year she died, but but she Were you guys she, close? she was a brilliant girl. She was in the same class as Clinton over in uh, uh, over in England. Were you guys close growing up as a family? What? Were you guys close as a family? We were we were close as a family when we were growing up. But after we grew up, why well, Dorothy was in the education world. She. She thought that was it, and I was in the engineering world. I thought that was it. And so she, in the education world, all her kids went to school and everything. My kid, None of my kids graduated from college. What were some of the things you did for fun growing up? For fun? Oh. <laughs> uh, the most fun we had growing up was playing cards, if you really want to know it. When anything, everything is shut down, you can't do anything. You play cards, and that was uh, th that's what we did instead of looking at television today. And but playing playing cards, you're always having a lot of fun. You have a real good family together and everything. And what card games would you play? Oh, everything. Uh, I, my grandpa Hughes. Uh, what was the game? Euchre. He loved to play Euchre. So uh, every time I saw my grandpa, I was playing <laughs> Euchre. The, then my mom and dad liked Bridge and Pinochle. So uh, all of us were good at Pinochle and Bridge. Uh, 500, oh, uh, 500 was a simple Bridge game. So we played 500 a lot and when there were good bridge players around. And so that was essentially the way I grew up. And in the farming, I was 12 years old and we had a farm in Salem, uh, north, east, north of Salem, Kaiser Bottom area of Salem it was called. And, and we had a uh, I think Dad had, uh, I think, a 43-acre farm there. And the, the 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 north end of the farm, this Willamette River does a U-turn at Salem, Oregon, like that, and goes on to, to Oregon City and Portland. But on that U-turn, the farm was on the far side of that U-turn. So the high water used to come, and come through the farm every so often. Uh, and uh, it was a 35-foot bank, so the river has to come up 35 feet to, to get get there, but that, that was where it was. So we always had driftwood and stuff like that for burning and everything. So would, did you guys eventually move to Salem, or would you split time between yeah. Oakland and Salem? Yeah. So he had a good farm. He had big cherry trees, and I was a little kid, and I'd go up and pick cherries, build big bean cherries, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and climbing ladders and everything, and picking strawberries. He had uh, braceros coming up from Mexico. One, two, 
two or three families. I don't know how many families were. I don't remember. But they'd come up and Dad would say, George, your body's made to work. He said, why don't you go out there and show these guys how to pick strawberries? And he gave me instruction on how to pick strawberries and pick out the good ones and his come in so everything is perfect with a flat. And you used to get, I think, two cents for picking a flat. <laughs> But that, that, that was, that's the way I grew up on farms. Um, and can you talk a little bit about surviving through the Great Depression? Did you guys uh, experience any hardships? Oh, we, the, uh, the Depression area hit and school teachers weren't even being paid. And dad took a job at Armstrong College as well as teaching in the Oakland school system. And he was a. Uh, oh well, I should should tell you, uh, in the Oakland school system, he was out to get school teacher pensions. Then he was a uh, representative for the Oakland school system at the NEA convention in Philadelphia, where sc school teachers first got pensions. And Dad never got a pension, and so Mom never got any pension money off of that, but. But mom was a school teacher, so she got, she had her pension. Uh, she was, she lived out with dad by quite a lot. Dad died in, um, uh, uh, fifty. So you were about 28 when he passed. Yeah. Dad don't. 1950 from cancer. And uh, besides working on the farm, did you have any other jobs growing up? Oh, carrying papers. I carried three papers routes in the Depression. I carried a, a morning paper, Post Enquirer, evening paper, Oakland Tribune, and uh, on a Wednesday, shopping news. Shopping news was every house, a simple route. The others, you, you'd had specials and you had to click for them and everything else. So I used to be a kid on a bicycle with $150 in my pocket and Depression area, Oakland. And I always used to worry about that. That's a lot of money back then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, Oakland was a, was a pretty rough town even then. Yeah, it was... Uh, Seventh, Seventh Street, Oakland, as it was um, the the waterfront area. And that's where the big uh, waterfront supplies and everything else are. Now, did you graduate from high school? I graduated from Oakland High. In what year? Nineteen thirty-six. And what did you do after you graduated high school? Went to Cal, Berkeley. How many years did you spend there? Four and a half. And you studied engineering there? What? You studied engineering there? Yes. I started out I started out in mining and changed to CE civil, and then changed to uh, mechanical aeronautical. There was no aeronautical and it was mechanical. And I drew LMK Belter as faculty advisor. And Alan K. Belter was an exceptional professor. He was uh, in the atomic bomb deal, and Lawrence Labs was on campus at Cal when I went through there. So I did a lot of uh, work for uh, Belter and, and in the Lawrence Labs in my upper years. My lower years were, all, were mining and civil engineering. But all the physics and stuff like that you had taken in the lower grades. So you had graduated from Berkeley uh, in 1940, 1941? Class of 1940. And then you went to start... Uh, I was hired by Consolidated Aircraft. Right. The guy who hired me was uh, the designer of the Graf Zeppelin. And he, he hired, he came up, he, and Reuben Fleet was head of 
consolidated aircraft at that time. And what were your responsibilities there? Well, I went down. I I finished at Cal. I put. I worked on the wind tunnel, and New Departure came up with a three ball bearing that you put a pin in. And so I replaced all the bearings on that wind tunnel with these three ball bearings to reduce all the friction. And it worked out great. And with that experience, when I hit Consolidated, they sent me to Pasadena, to the Green Hotel. And they had a uh, Guggenheim Aer Aeronautical Laboratory, California Institute of Technology, Gelsit. Gelsit Wind Tunnel was on pa Pasadena, right where you entered the, the, the freeway going, the, uh, the Rico Freeway there. And uh, it's a big power transfer deal now there. But the administration building is still there. So you were working for them when... Now, to get an idea, the B-24 is the first tricycle landing gear aircraft. And it's a bomber. The B-17 is a tail dryer. It's t taking off like this. It already has a positive angle of attack. The real problem on the B-24 being the first tri tricycle landing gear is to jump over a 50-foot obstacle that's 6,000 6, feet down the runway, a nautical mile down the runway. And so to do that, we had to come up with a flap system that worked. So what I was doing there was developing the Fowler flap system that's on, that was on the B-24. It was a series of three flaps and how do, you, how do you get those so you, you come and you go over this 50-foot obstacle? So that, that was the, uh, it all worked out fine and we did it. <laughs> but that, that was my start on the B-24. And so you were, you were working on that about the time that uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked. Yeah, well, yeah. Yes. When Pearl Harbor, nineteen forty, Pearl Harbor was attacked on in December. I, by December, I was back consolidated. That was only in Pasadena for about, I guess, it was two and a half months. Okay. And I came back and. Uh, and so I was on the B-24 program, and uh, they right off the bat, before Pearl Harbor, uh, uh, Reuben Fleet, Donald Douglas, uh, um, Dutch Kendallburger, North American, and Ed Scott, Ford Motor Company, were, were had a conference going, and so there was a whole bunch of us who were representatives of them, all meeting at the Grant Hotel in San Diego. And we're all living at the Cort El Cortez Hotel. So we leave the El Cortez and come down to the meeting of the Grant. And then go back to El Cortez. So, and we were having conference the whole time. It was a 24-hour deal, more, than, more or less, planning on the B-24 Bomber plant. And when we started that, the first thing that went up was a school building because we had a they were going to go from zero to 400 airplanes a, a month in six months. So we had to have a lot of people available that were trained. So that's the first school that went up. So we went back, to, we developed the school and started the school and got the whole barn plant going. And everything, everything went right on schedule. It was a beautiful deal. And... Uh, uh, the newspapers, the unions got a hold of it and said there's, there's, uh, I forget how many, I think 50,000 be, being paid 
to sit around and do nothing at Fort Little Run. What are you going to do? You're training these people, and they're trained. If you don't pay them, they're off. To, uh, they're gone. They're, we had no other way. So they came out and looked at that, and Truman comes out and looks at the deal, and and goes. He, we have a big meeting at the Book Cadillac Hotel. His exact words are, everything's hunky-dory at Willow Run. And he goes back with Ma, Ma Perkins, and they talk it all over, and decided to change all the powers that be. So that took General Vanderman out from right field, General K.B. Wolf out from head of the Bomber Command, and all of us working at Willow Run. So that, that took us all out just like that. And so uh, we're the guys that actually developed that, but the people that came on afterwards were the ones that uh, get all the credit. And so I, that's when I went back to consolidating, and that's when they were starting on a B-46. So... And then now the B-46, I've already told you about that. I want to know about uh, December 7th, 1941. Where were you when you learned that Pearl Harbor had been attacked? We ride a consolidated aircraft. Do you remember on that day, On December though? 7th. Were you at work on that Sunday? On December 7th, I went down to see Autumn. Laverne Autumn was uh, uh, the engineer on the F-104, F the first supersonic fighter airplane that consolidated did. He, did. he did that later on. But I, I went down to see Autumn. Uh, he lived on B Street in a big apartment there, and it overlooked the harbor. And on De December 8th, he got word from the government to pay his rent to the government. And they picked up the owner of the apartment. The owner of the apartment had a cupola up on top there, and he was surveying everything the fleet did. And and this was Zacharias, and, and uh, you can read it in Zacharias's book. And Zacharias and Mayor and uh, Los Angeles uh, Mayor Biscalos were the ones responsible for picking up all the Japanese spies on De on December eighth. They had the whole thing outlined, and they picked up I think twenty six hundred spies. German and Japanese spies on December 8th. They had the whole thing outlined. You can read that in Zacharias's book. How did you learn that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor? I, I was right at, um, uh, well, Sunday was there. And so on Monday we could report to work and we were all giving sidearms and we we're looking for uh, the Japs coming in because we figured they'd be coming in uh, California. That's the biggest mistake that the Japs made. They went into the Philippines instead. But how did you learn that we had been attacked? Did you hear it on the radio? Did you hear it from... I heard it on the radio. Okay. So what no, did you think when you... That's the only thing we had. So what did you think when you heard that news? Mm, no, I heard it on the radio. But we had, we had portable radios too. No, I had a portable radio. I keep track of it. Were you surprised? Were you shocked? No, we weren't surprised. We were expecting it. We were expecting it. Uh, well, I think uh, the whole darn, whole darn Pacific Navy was expecting it. So how did that change uh, your work in the days and months following? Well, it changed the time element. They had no time for anything then. You just work, work, work. No. No, uh, we, we really thought the Japanese were coming in. That's why the Japs had to be quarantined. The reason for the quarantines in the book, too. Now, Secret Missions by Abel Zacharias. That's it. You can get it from the Navy Press, Navy Institute Press. So you had continued working for two more years before you joined the Navy, correct? Yeah. 
Were you drafted or did you enlist? What? Were you drafted or did no. you enlist? No, I told you. They, they came in, they, we all, there was five of us all quit. And Ma Perkins told us we couldn't, couldn't quit. So we all volunteered for the service. And why did you choose the Navy? I had a lot to do with the PBY too. And then I, I, I was more a Navy man than, than an Air Force man. I knew General Wolf and all those guys, but I'd, I'd uh, grown up with, I'd sailed with uh, two admirals on San Diego Bay to, as a crewman. And I'd uh, uh, developed a speedboat up in Santa Rae Avenue, Oakland with, with uh, Dick Weeks, Admiral Weeks on. And we were going to race that up in Seattle as an inboard speedboat. And uh, we were doing 100 miles an hour in Oakland Estuary when we, there's a pile just sinking dead ahead, and we both went like that. I was in the right seat, and Dick was in the left, and we went like that, skip, and went in. So that experience, uh, that, that was the uh, most life-threatening experience I'd had up until that time. You mentioned earlier that you went to Florida for uh, amphibious training. What? You mentioned earlier that you went to Florida for amphibious training. Yeah. Can you talk about that experience? Well, uh, you, you go go to uh, at Fort Pierce, Florida. The commanding officer was that was uh, Captain Gold Branson, and he's the the captain who ran destroyers in the ground up off of Point Reyes up here, and. Uh, uh, so he he was a pretty rough captain. And I I go there, and we're throwing telephone poles back and forth, and the okay you're all in train. So tomorrow we're go, we're going to go swimming. And so tomorrow I come at at midnight. We got woken up. We got put in peoples. We got taken up to. Uh, we didn't know where we were being taken, but it turns out we were being taken north from Fort Pierce up to just south of, uh, uh, oh heck, the northern town of Florida there, I can't think of it right now. At any rate, we're dumped in the ocean a mile out at sea. And they say, you're a mile out at sea, you got, you got a mile to swim to the beach, Let's see how fast you can do it. So we're dumped in the ocean at night. I've never been swimming in the ocean at night. So that's quite an experience, I'll tell you. you yeah, your imagination takes over. I, you have a compass on your wrist and a watch. Watch like that. And so I, I, I'd i been flying and doing stuff enough so that I, you know, I went straight in. No problem. But uh, that was, talk about being scared, that was scared. And that's one of the things Kennedy did, if you read his book, he went swimming for two and a half miles at night because he was afraid of the Japs seeing him to, to rescue those guys that were ruined on a little island. If you read Kennedy's book. And he, he, he did that voluntarily. And I'll give him credit for that one, boy. Because that's, that's scary. You get dumped in the ocean at night, you think about what you, you would feel like. So you, you must have been a pretty strong yeah. swimmer. Yeah. What? You must have been a pretty strong swimmer. Oh, I was, I was a strong swimmer. Yeah, I, I was swimming for, oh, oh there, that's another long story. Forget that one. Not, a, not just a swimmer. <laughs> well, tell me more about your training, besides being dumped in the ocean. Well, 
No, the training went on from then. We got trained in Lake Okeechobee there. And, uh, yeah. What were some other things that you went through? Well, no, at Fort Pierce, you go to the jungle training there. So tell me about it. Well, you, you get assigned a, a team, and you and another, and, and uh, Wally Underwood, a uh, son of Underwood typewriter, was in the same training. Uh, he and I were both trained together by Seminole Indians. And so we were trained there, and it, it, it was a real jungle area at that, at that time. This is in the 40s. And uh, alligators would be sitting here like that, and you think it's a log. You step on that, and it's an alligator. Okay, <laughs> and snake dropped down, you chop his head off, and there's food for you. The little water moccasins had a habit of dropping down. And uh, we, we went through a lot of stuff there, and it, it, including eating grubs, uh, breaking a log open, eating grubs, and the rest of it. So were you guys out there for days at a time? What? Were you guys out in the jungle for days at a time? No, we, we went in to there on... We went in the Monday morning and came out uh, w w two weeks later on a Saturday. So it wasn't quite two weeks. It, it was Sunday. It was a, a day less than two weeks. So while you were out there, what were they training you for? For the duty I was going to do. Okay. Well, what? which was was turned out to be the clean-up at Saipan. Well, I came out, I went from Fort Pierce to Coronado, and I was in training at Coronado, then we did, we did landings at, at the, uh, uh, He's, the Navy Island uh, out here, that's up beyond Catalina. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. What's the Navy Island out there? I can't think of the name. But they were they were training you as an uh, as an elite force, correct? Yeah. Which is. No. We, I, we, I got tra we got trained there, and then I went out and I got assigned to Y and I. I come in at Y and I, uh, and that's on the west side of Oahu, and it's the best beach on Oahu, really, and it's all it's all is completely. Secure from all the big tides, all the big waves coming down. There's a point on a wall that comes out and it comes back like this, and the wall comes and comes back like this, and Y and I is right here. The best beach in Oahu, and we're under uh, uh, the amphibious supply depot was um, Barber's Point which is down right at the south end of, of Oahu there. And so we used to get all the supplies and everything from Barber's Point. And we were in training there. There, there was up to, uh, they told me there was up to 10 teams there, or there was five or six teams when I was there. And how big is a team? 10 men, 10 men teams, all of us. So pretty small units. Yeah, and we're all, all of, all specialists and no, uh, the the. I had two more important guys. The, the most two important guys in my team was, I had uh, a guy named King, who was my bosun. And uh, my radioman Duncan, and Duncan was a fifteen-year-old, but he's the best radio operator in the Navy, I think. Now he used to be. We'd be practicing for the Japanese invasion, which was later on 
and he knew everything was going on. And uh, they'd always be coming to me, well, what's going on, George? And I'd, I'd be telling them. Now, while you're going through this training, were there people that dropped out or, or couldn't make it through the training? Oh, the, yeah, there's all kinds of people dropped out in the training. Tell me about that, that ratio. Well, people the, the biggest dropouts were at Fort Pierce. The, the, the cold water there was what took them all out. You know, the, the, the Fort Pierce, they have a countercurrent coming down from Maine. They call it the Indian River. And it's all coming southward through there. And so that's real cold water in the winter time. And we'd be swimming for, we'd, we'd be swimming and, and come in and t it'd be a half an hour before we'd change from, from blue to a, a good skin color in a, in a warm shower, never, never a, a hot shower. Now, was this a voluntary position that you were a part of? Yeah, it was a volunteer for me, but the, the team, the guys I got were guys that volunteered for duty out of Portsmouth. Portsmouth is a Navy prison. And so they volunteer for this duty and get out, and those are the guys that I had for, for working for me. So I'm trying to, trying to convey... But other than Duncan. Other than Duncan. Duncan was a, a kid who volunteered, an underage kid. Because the, the training that you went through was probably a bit more rigorous than uh, regular naval training. Regular naval training? Yeah, so the training that you had experienced mm -hmm. yeah. in this instance. After the war was over, I got assigned to the USS, U.S. Munda at CVE 104. Okay. And I uh, got assigned to, as engineering officer at Pensacola, Florida. And the CV 104, when I went aboard there, Commander Connolly, who was the air officer, took me under his wing and he taught me everything that, that carrier had. But while you were going through the, the amphibious training, was there any point that you considered dropping out? Did you think it was too hard no. at any point? No, 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 no. World War II was not any, not any choosing at all. There was no choice in World War II. It was completely life or death. Don't ever let anybody kid you. There was no choice. You're doing something, you're doing it, and your country's in danger, and that's all. That was the West Coast. I don't know about the East Coast. The East Coast was different. So when you had gone to Hawaii for, for more training, what, what changed there? Was it more swimming? What else did, were you training? Oh, we were, we were experimenting with, with all kinds of swimming gear. We were experimenting with all kinds of explosives. We had, we were blowing up. They made like jacks with railroad rails. Six, three rails made like jacks, and so we, uh, if that was on the beach, how do we blow this up? And we were taking RDX and wrapping it around the apex and seeing how many wraps it took. We were biting the fuses down with our teeth and, and taking off and, and letting it go and messing with that. We're messing with swim fins from that long to that long, and uh, uh, flexible and rigid. Everything else, we're trying everything. And we had a, every Friday we had a 17 mile swim with, this was with, with fins, okay? You're swimming, you're swimming five miles an hour with fins, with fins so that's only three hours. But, but you're only swimming two miles an hour if you're swimming this way, and you're two miles an hour or less, so there's a heck, that's a real long swim, but with fins is not bad. So the jacks would be obstacles the enemy would put on the beach to deter any yeah. any landing. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, we we did um, the most notable raid we did was um, Zacharias had a submarine tender and two submarines. The submarine tender had a submarine S one and S two. 
if, if the Navy ever looks at that, they'll find out what we actually did. Because he used those, he put the submarine 10 and the two submarines off here. We'd go, we'd have a meeting at, at uh, Sink Pack and go in a Jeep right down to where we're taking off. And usually it was a, a PBY. We'd fly the PBY out to where the submarine tender was, and then get aboard the submarines and go to, go to an operation there. So what was the first operation you were a part of? Oh, well, none of them are known, but the, the one that was the most, uh, we never talked about them, really. We just did them, and some of them we didn't even know what we were doing. We just did them because we didn't, even, we didn't even know where we were. But most notable one was on a radio station on, on Taiwan. In ta Taiwan, we in the we came into the Taiwan Straits and we came in to a beach and came up a uh, about a 40, 40 foot cliff and came in about a mile and a half to the West Highway going going up t Taiwan and the radio station was there. And we had orders if the ducks were there, abort the mission. And what does that mean? And the the ducks, the ducks weren't there. We didn't know what it meant, but we found out that we get there and there's no ducks. So we took and we planted the plastic explosive. We all each had had an explosive and we planted on the left hand side of every corner of every building. And then we got back to the submarine. The whole thing blew up. And uh, the, they heard about it, and the Navy did a movie on it. Uh, I, I guess the Navy at San Diego, I don't know who did the movie on it, but they, they never knew what happened. And we were fighting Japs with climbing rocks and everything. We never saw a Jap in the whole mission. So that was to destroy communication. Yeah. <laughs> never saw a Jap in the whole mission. Came back, and we just had a good time. So take me through that mission. You guys uh, started on a submarine. Well, no, what what happened, we meet with Zacharias and uh, we meet at Sink Pack with the planners of the operation. And it wasn't even Zacharias sometimes, but there were, it's all intelligence planning. You know, we can do this and we can do this. Zacharias was the guy who figured out how to take uh, uh, the Japanese, when the Air, Navy airplanes uh, 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 down the, the Japanese Admiral Zacharias was the guy who figured that out. He's, he's the, he was the, the most influential guy in World War II, I think, more than anybody else. And, um, so it was not a, and he, I don't think, I lost two guys in Saipan. It's the only time I lost anybody. Okay, so this mission in Taiwan that you, you talked about, where you guys blew up the radio station, mm -hmm. take me through that mission. You guys, where did you guys start? You, you started on, on a submarine? Yeah, we, we went to the submarine tender. So how did you get to shore? We swam. Okay, so how far did you swim? Oh, I'd say maybe 300 yards. And what did you have uh, equipment-wise with you? You had fins? Nothing. Naked skin and an uh, explosive pack. Did you have a mask? No. No, we had fins, that's all. And this was a, a stealth mission, correct? Huh? This was a stealth mission, correct? Yeah. So how many No, it wasn't a scout mission. It was a demolition mission. But I mean, you had to be stealth in in your mm -hmm. approach. We were not. Well, all we had was a knife. Correct. If we're going to fight, we're gonna, it was with a knife, nothing else. So you had to avoid detection. What? You had to avoid being seen. Yeah. No, it was uh, all stealth. And was this during and, the daytime? Or and it turns the out, it turns out the secret of that mission 
was that ducks were what the Japanese were using for security around the radio station. And it turns out that the Chinese herd ducks like like we herd pigs or cattle or anything, okay? They herd ducks. And so this guy was furnishing ducks, and the ducks would be there and the ward and every, everything would be alarmed, okay? With no ducks, no alarms, so we, we, we had freedom to do everything, and they never even knew what was happening. And did you conduct this mission during the daytime, or was it at night? Night. Oh, no, nothing in daytime. Okay. Nothing in the daytime. So how many men were a part of this mission? Oh. You and how many others? I'd, I'd say there was... I think there were three teams of us. So about 30 men? Yeah, about 30 men. That's a, that's about all I could get on a submarine too. Yeah, so we, we, could, we came in on two submarines. So once you reached the shore, how long did it take you to get to the radio station? Two and a half hours. Of walking? Uh, climbing up a cliff and walking in. And you, you're, it's not a fast deal. You're, you're looking, you, do, you don't want anybody seeing you or anything. And you're going out as the longest deal because you, you're covering your tracks. So you're barefoot while yeah. you're doing this? Yeah. Yeah. And did you leave your fins on the beach? Yeah. And the explosives, are you, is that? The, the, all we have is explosives and walking. So how long did it take you to yeah, climb and that a knife. cliff? And the knife. All, always had a knife. Mm -hmm. That's all it was. No, no, nothing fantastic about it. Just, just work. I think it's pretty fantastic. Just work, that's all. <laughs> so it took you about two and a half hours to get to that radio station, plant the explosives. Yeah. I don't know how long it took really. Well. All, all I know is we got there and we had electronic timer. And when, when electronic timer was punched, we had so many, so it, it was scheduled up for blowing up uh, an hour and a half from the time we punched it. And so we had that time to get back to the sub, so we were in a hurry getting back. Well, and you mentioned you had to cover your tracks on the way back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Explain to me a, a little bit about that. Well, all or nothing to it, you're barefoot, and most of, a lot of people are barefoot around there, so you didn't worry about that. You're worried about scrapes or anything like that, that was all. Is that mainly on the beach, yeah. or is that? Yeah. And the Japs, it was set up so the Japs, the guy who, the Chinese on Taiwan were responsible for it as far as the Japs were concerned, because they, they're the ones that stopped the ducks. So they were in on the, on the yeah. operation as well. Yeah. So we, we weren't even, a, we weren't even su suspected. <laughs> now did you guys have any flashlights? No. Did you have a map? How did you know how, no. where the radio station no. was? No, no, no. Duncan had a radio. That was all. He was the only one in my group had a radio. No, we didn't use radio at all. We used radio in the jungle of Saipan. And that, that was uh, just we had. We had the whole thing coordinated, so if we're moving from one coordinator to another, we put, we just say A4 or B6, and everybody knew who was, who was saying, so they know who we were, so we weren't cutting each other up. So you guys had uh, nicknames or code names, yeah, essentially. So. Once you returned to the beach and had to swim back out to the submarine, how would you locate where that submarine was? It was well, pitch black. No, out. we knew where it was. We'd left it and come back. Sure. You no, know, you're swimming with a compass. So you use the compass for navigation. Oh, yeah. Use a compass all the time. Yeah. No. No, we even knew just about how many strokes it was to get in. 
And did you see the the explosion? Of oh the yeah, station? we got back the submarine. And we waited for it. The skipper didn't take off till it blew up. Now, was that your first mission, or was that, you what? mentioned it was your most notable mission. Was that your first one? No, my first mission was Saipan. Can you tell, talk to me about that one? I don't know much about that one. Well, we were, we were in the jungle killing Japs. That's all with knives. No guns. We were, the Japs were coming out of the jungle and raiding businesses in Tanapeg. And our job was to stop the Japs from coming out at night. So, in the daytime, we were there, the Marines looking over all the trails and figuring out what we could do. At nighttime, we were monitoring the trails. So, how did you arrive on Saipan? What? How did you arrive on Saipan? Did you swim ashore again? Navy Air. Okay. Navy Air. No. No, no. I came in. It was a the Marines had already taken Saipan when I got there. All we were doing was stopping the Japs from coming out of the jungle raiding the businesses. They were coming out and killing people every night. So they they call that mop up duty. Hmm. What? They call that mop up duty. I don't know. I don't know what they call it. We had no name for it. <laughs> so you guys. Tell me what you were doing. You, you guys were, at nighttime, you were alongside the trails? Yeah. We'd, we'd had two guys. We'd be here like this, a trail would be here. And, and so this guy rattled a bush. Uh, the last guy in the co Japanese column rattled a bush, and the, Japanese, the last guy in the column turned this, and they'd come and stick a knife in him. That was, that was the whole plan. That was all there was to it. We did that for a week and a half. And did you guys encounter many, many Japanese? I don't know. Well, there was, I don't know how many teams of us are, were doing this. I think the whole darn works was, was there. And you mentioned that you lost two guys on Saipan. Yeah. Yeah, they thought they could take the, they thought they could take a Japanese officer out. And the Japanese officer had to cut the piece of his moral sword before they knew what happened. <laughs> Were they members of your team? What? Were they members of your yeah. team? Yeah. Members of my team. I gave them permission to try it. Was that pretty hard to lose those guys? What? Was that pretty tough on you to lose those guys? Yeah, it was tough. It was tough. No, we weren't in the habit of losing anybody. I don't think, I don't think in all operations that, that Zachariah's plan, I don't think he lost, I don't think over 100 people. No, that's when the operation stopped when I lost two guys. Say we, that again? We, that's when the operation stopped. When I, lost, when I lost two guys, they stopped the whole thing right then. You guys were, were valuable. What? You guys were very valuable. They couldn't lose you guys. Mm. Well. So this was your, your first experience of combat on Saipan. Yeah. Did that change your mental outlook? What? Did that change your mental outlook? After your experiences, not there? really, not really, not really. No, I. I don't know. I. I. I grew up in Oakland at at Oakland High. My dad was a teacher at Oakland High when I started there. And my dad was a, a 
Golden Gloves champion boxer in the University of Iowa. So I learned to fight pretty early. And uh, I'd get in a fight at Oakland High, and the principal had called Dad out of class, your son has been in a fight. So Dad had a transfer to Gus. So I, and there's, we had a boxing coach at Oakland High. He was a saddest, really. And uh, he'd always have, uh, one guy was a real good boxer, Dick Mursky, and Dick Mursky always beat me. But he'd put Dick Mursky against a friend I had, Jerry Engs, and he'd be beating the heck out of Jerry Engs, and I'd say, hey, quit this, I'll take on Dick again. <laughs> so I'd be fighting with him. That, that, that was my background at Oakland High. So fighting was part of my deal. Got it. And we, I was in competition swimming for Lakeside Plunge when I was in high school. Okay. There was no swimming in high school. No, high school was not a, swimming was not a high school sport. No pools or anything. So let me ask you the, the conditions that you were living in on Saipan. You were there for a few Outside weeks. Outside where? The, when you were on Saipan, the conditions that you were living in. What? Can you tell me about that? Oh, uh, on, the, on the beach at Waianae? No, in Saipan. The Saipan? Yes. Nothing. L living in a hotel. So you were living in a hotel, and then at nighttime you'd go out along yeah. the trail? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, the, the, the uh, Saipan was secure. Saipan was secure. These guys were coming out of the jungle raiding businesses. So during the day? Yeah. No, during the night. Right. They're coming out at night. Right, that's when you guys would, would that's monitor when we the were, trail. That's when we were taking them out. Right, but during, during the, the day, we are in the hotel. Okay, all right, that's what I wanted to know. And then after Saipan, um, what followed that? Yeah. What did you do after, after well, Saipan? We did a number of things. A lot of it I don't I have no idea. If they'd ever, uh, I don't know, I don't think anything, any, it's on record any place. You were a part of a, a number of top secret missions? No, we, we did, I guess, all together. And all the time I was there, four, four or five missions. Some more, some more, just little deals. Then, well, we had one deal. They, they have a, uh, there's a little island out beyond your your island. What what what's the name of that island? It's about ten miles long and three miles wide. What's the name of that island? The Japs had a spy station on that island. And Nimitz was using that spy station by running ships past there so the Japs have all kinds of intelligence on our Navy moving past that island. And Japs said, uh, and he was just making sure that the, the Japs had all the information they wanted and just left them there, left them there, left them there. Well, before the, before, when it, before, before, Before the end of the war, he t took that out. And so a bunch of us went over there and took the deal out. No, that was all. The, the Japs were supplying it was by submarine. And so we did the schedule and everything else. But, so that was, that was one mission I knew about that is is on record. So what do you mean you you took the deal out? What does that mean? No, we w went there and, and just took the Japs crew off the island, cleared, cleared them out. Yeah, they they had a big deal spy up. I don't know who did what. We, we were uh, my deal was on the beach all the time. So what did you do? Nothing. Got got on the beach and was looking at protection for the Marines that were doing the takeout.
And you said you were a part of a few other missions as well. Yeah. Can you tell me about your experience during those? Do you, you, you said you don't remember where you uh, were necessarily. What? A few of the other missions that you mentioned, you didn't. You don't know where you were specifically. No. But can you talk to me about the actions that you took, what you did, what the what those missions were, to the best of your recollection? No. No, I don't want to say any more about that. Okay. That's enough. All right. That's enough on that. All right. Hmm. Not a problem. No. Yeah. I'm getting getting in deep water if I go any further. No problem. So as we're approaching the uh, the end of the war. What? Well, I got aboard the Munda, went through training with Zacharias, and went back to Pensacola. And uh, Truman got the. Uh, Truman was getting a Korean War going, and uh, that's when I got out of the Navy. So were you on the Munda before the end of World War Two? Yeah. yeah. No, this was after World War Two. Okay. So where were you when the war had ended? What? Where were you when the war had ended? Yeah, why and I? We were, no, I wasn't in B and Q6. We were, we were going on board. We were going on board ships for the Japanese invasion. So you guys were preparing to no, invade Japan? No. The, all of us, why and I, when they called Zacharias back to Washington, which is in March of 1945, Zacharias was called back to Washington. And when he was called back to Washington, all of us started on a Japanese invasion. And we were invading the southern beaches of Maui. Uh, and we'd the task force would assemble east of Maui, the deep water area there. We'd go out to sea, 200 miles of sea, and come in and invade the beach once a week. That was your training? Training for, the for Japanese invasion. And we're going in, going into a Japanese island, Hokkaido, in the south, south end of Hokkaido. There's a, a saddle and a mountain. And we're going in uh, there and we're going to put an airport right there. And would you guys have been the first ones in? We were going to be the first ones in. Yeah. Yeah. If that had ever happened, it would have been dead. We had a reserve five, five deep behind us. <laughs> you had five teams yeah. behind you? Yeah. Is that what you, okay. Yeah. Now, did you experience any close calls uh, during your time in the service? Oh, I've had a lot of close calls. Any that you're willing to speak on? No. My closest calls have been in flying. So you're a pilot as well? No, the first B-24 we... The first B-24E, Ford B-24, we were using that for winterization, and we were flying out. We were going up to Minneapolis, St. Paul, and flying that up uh, to uh, around Whitehorse in that area of Canada, looking for looking for icy conditions. We'd be at, at uh, 20, 20, 22,000 feet normally, and we'd get icing formed, and then we'd turn on the heated wing icing, which was brand new at that time, and see how, see how long it took to for the ice to clear off the leading edge. And we'd be going down. We'd be losing altitude all the time, no way to climb. And so doing that, why uh, uh, everything worked fine. And one Sunday, 
they were just, we were at, at this uh, Patterson Field, which is east of Wright Field there at Dayton. And I went out to Patterson, and we, it was a Sunday operation. And <clears throat> so I begged off the flight that Sunday because I was behind in my, my mail to uh, Consolidated San Diego. And so I, I went and used the secretary. They had a, a secretary in Dayton for all the stuff. And we're twixing stuff. So I wrote a whole bunch of twixes. And um, out to there and came back to the field. And the flight was about to secure the test flight. It, I knew it was going to be about 1,400. So I get back there, meet the colonel. And we go out there. It was about 800 foot to overcast. And that thing came out overcast like that and straightened up. And the left hand pa uh, panel of the wing just folded up like that. And it went right into the runway. And everybody killed. Now I, I was on the manifest. <laughs> you could have been on that flight. If I'd have been in flight, I'd have been dead right then. <laughs> yeah, no. But that was part of my fault, too. At Willow Run, everything was automatic, and you had drilling templates, all right? And the, where the outer panel meets the, the center section, we had a whole big bunch of aluminum forgings. And the, I looked at that forging and went out there and looked where the figure was, and I called Ed Scott, and he came down. And there was a whole bunch of missing fasteners in that panel. And we never put the holes in for the, the fasteners, so they never put the fasteners in. The automatic drilling template, we missed it. And we missed it on 47 airplanes. And that crash, we ground on 47 airplanes that day. And they all would have had the same failure. And there was a left hand, the right hand, the right hand in order auto propellant was fine. This left hand one was not. Did you feel res somewhat responsible at all for that? What? Did you feel somewhat responsible at all for that? Yeah, well, the, the, all of us uh, in inspection or any, everything. Yeah. It's, it's just something you make, get a production line and you get everything going and everything is fine. You're looking over, you, I don't know how many times I checked that. I didn't see it. Just a matter of eyeball. And then the same, same with uh, Tom Dito, Roger Ketchman, uh, Ed Scott, all of us. All of us. We we check that stuff all the time. We we're constantly checking everything. But there was the worst deal that ever happened on a B twenty four. was after we all got fired and Branshaw took over Wright Field and Carl Scott became chief engineer of, of Will Run. Why, in the weight reduction program, they took out the, the fire extinguisher system that we had on number three engine. And so they were taking that out and we knew this was wrong, but the modification center that Consolidated had was at, at uh, Tucson, Davis Mountain Airport. And so we, we were down there on that, uh, Captain Mooner and uh, uh, George Agnew, uh, I think Charlie Friel. I don't know. Uh, anyway, there, there were about six of us uh, on on this airplane, and we got a fire in the number three engine taken off. No fire station. He put it down in the desert, and we all got, all got out. And Agnew was the first one out. He's the only guy that got, got hurt in that crash. But that airplane burned. It. That was where 
the, the red oil got that airplane so hot that the aluminum burned like magnesium. That's what happened on a space shuttle when it came in. With a one-tile mission, it started the aluminum burning on that space shuttle, and it just burned with magnesium. That's what happened in that space shuttle. Same darn thing. This was preliminary to the space shuttle. I saw it happen right there. And that was how they shot down, how the WM-1 hydrazine airplane of Germany shot down so many B-24s in the, in the invasion. The missing, that missing fire extinguisher system was a secret. If it had been there, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have lost a whole bunch of B-24s. But we didn't make enough noise about it. Well, everything was, we were shut down completely. So I understand that the, the unit that you were working with in, in World War II, you guys are sort of uh, like the modern day Navy SEALs, is that correct? What? The, the unit that you were with in World War II, the operations that you guys would perform, you guys were nicknamed uh, frogmen. Right? Yeah, they they've recognized us as a CLD now. She she can tell you about that. <laughs> that, that happened last in November, no, two years ago. What's that? Yeah. Frogmen uh, was a commemorative yeah. ceremony that yeah. they did out in San Diego. Oh, great. Yeah. Mm. They put a yeah. beautiful bronze statue and they invited all of the um, naked warrior. Yeah. Mm. The, they yeah. invited all the um, veterans that it had been part of that, and they had them by class. And um, they had all these admirals there, and they did a big, big ceremony, big celebration in honor of them. You guys yeah. laid the foundation for them. Yeah. Well, I don't know about foundation. We were just doing experimental stuff. It was experimental. Doing en engineering, essentially. Very That's what I am as an engineer. You guys did so much with so little. Mm-hmm. No, uh, you know, the, the oxygen regulators, they uh, use those in, in the airplanes. That's what we're doing winterization with. Before I went in the Navy. So you joined in 1943. When did you get out of the Navy? What year? 45. No, yeah, 45. And what was your rate? Ensign. Which class? What? Which class? You said ensign? Ensign. That's that's the rank. That's the lowest lowest officer rank. So when you returned home from the war, where did you go? What did you do? When I returned home? I lived in, lived in San Diego. Did you go back to work? No, I don't want to even get into that. Don't want to even get into that. All right. When I returned home from the war, I spent three hours walking Ocean Beach Contemplating a one-way swim. He, he was very depressed and suicidal. Okay. Some of the stuff he had done. I guess the killings and stuff had gotten to him. And I look at all these veterans now, and they need help when they come home. And Diane Feinstein has has it set up so a veteran can't get help until the, all the records are secure and inspected, and everything is is settled. So it's six months before a vet, veteran can even apply for help. So you got veterans committing suicide all over the place. So I don't want to get into that stuff at all. That's okay. No, that's... That's part of part of what I'm fighting right now. You still live with that to this day? Yeah. No, I oh no, I just decided against it. 
But that decision hurt a lot of people and also created a lot of people. <laughs> okay? Well, I want to thank you very much for your service. Okay. Okay. And thank you for fighting for my freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and thank you for sitting down with me today and sharing your experiences with me. Yeah. No, there. No, I've been through a, a lot of aircraft stuff. I. After the war. I. Went to work for. I created a business, Allied Ladder Company. We built aluminum ladders, and then I went to work for Lockheed. And at Lockheed, I had the transmission on uh, age 56 Sarpan uh, helicopter. And that was the best helicopter I ever made. It had a, you have, have your big rotor, and then you have a Hamilton standing gearbox back here with a pushing rotor and a counter rotating rotor. And the Hamilton standard, though both those were variable pitch propellers. Hamilton standard variable pitch propellers. So you can control the thing every way. So you can fly, you can back up, you can do everything with that helicopter. You can come in, come into a cliff, and you come in, stop, go up the cliff, and go on. We flew it under bridges out of Ventura, did a lot, and we're flying it off of off of uh, Ventura. All of the test flights were off of Ventura out here. And the guy flying it got in trouble, and he was cr physically correcting it, and he, he went and drank and got killed. If he'd just taken his hands off the control, everything would have been straightened out right now, and he'd have been flying great. But that, that was the unusual part of the helicopter. The, the normal helicopter you're flying now, everything is up to the pilot. The pilot screw up, the whole thing screwed up. Let me ask you if you could offer any wisdom or advice for my generation and future generations, what would that be? For future generations? Well, I got one, th one thing that I think is permanent all through the, the whole deal. And the thing is, work creates wealth. Vacation, you're using wealth. So work is more important than any vacation. You, we've got the whole darn thing reversed in this world. If you, if you want a world where everybody's feeling good and wealthy, you've got to be working. Everybody's got to be working. And there's work that's creative. That's the work that starts new things like all the big money building the railroads. They all look at those. Oh, they're 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 robbers. They made a lot of money, but they built the railroads. That did more for everybody coming on than any, anything else. If they were laying around doing nothing, never would have happened. And that's what's going on right now. That's Donald Trump. He's creating wealth. He's creating wealth all over the world. And if he does that, politicians, what are they doing? The politicians can't exist unless they find some way of dipping into the wealth creating deal so that they can tax it and get money out of it and then give it to the poor so they get votes. That's all they can do. You look at it, look at it in a realistic way, that's the way it's happening. That's all this stuff against Trump. Those people, all they know how to do is take people that are creating wealth, find a way to, to tax them, and then take the wealth that they have and give to the poor. And that's not creating wealth, that's using wealth.
In other words, this whole idea of don't use your own money, which is the Harvard philosophy, never use your own money. Find a way to use other people's money and create wealth. That does not create wealth that uses wealth. And you're essentially a leech, Shen, as far as I'm concerned. Now, is there anything else that you'd like to offer um, that we haven't talked about? Mm. Religion? I'm, I think Jesus Christ was the, the biggest thing that ever happened. And when Christ was born, he was a little deal hero. And he was, uh, he was an Essene. The Essene uh, was a seagoing branch of the Jewish religion. You go clear back, Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Melchizedek was an Essene. Melchizedek established religions all the way over South America and up. The National Geographic, all, they were trying to find things wrong with Christian religion and Jewish religion. For years they've been all, all against it, but the, they've just confirmed all this stuff. You go through there and all of these Indian tribes through this whole area were all had uh, people that God had spoken to and God had spoken to all over the world. And he does it by what the Old Testament calls fire. But what is fire? And that's explained. Fire is not putting a candle under a haystack. Fire is putting in a candelabra, and the light from that candle lights the whole room. That's fire. It's light. All right? And I was touched with light when I was five years old. I was, Dad had me in the Lama River south of the farm there. And I was drowning and I, I just had a, a wonderful experience. Dad got me out and I was all right. So I, I know about that firsthand. And that was, that was when I was really young. And I think that you're going to see, you're going to see California changing completely, I think. All right. Well, okay. thank you very much for your time. Okay. Thank you.